It is my honor and my pleasure to bring the most requested doctor in high wire history. I'm talking about Dr. Andrew Kaufman is joining me now. All right, uh, Dr. Kaufman, uh, I mean everything I said. We are literally getting lambasted on YouTube. When are you going to finally talk to Dr. Andrew Kaufman? Are you afraid of Dr. Kaufman? Um, and so, I, because we are just, as I said, firing and shooting from the hip here, what is your background um, that makes your voice important enough that so many people are requesting you? So just give me a little history of where you come from and what your education and specialty is. Sure. Well, um, I studied uh, biology at MIT as an undergraduate where I first learned about research. Um, I worked at a couple of different biotech companies. Um, I was a physician assistant and I worked in cancer medicine, mostly in uh, hematology. And then I went to medical school and did my psychiatry residency at Duke and then subspecialized in forensic psychiatry uh, in Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York. And I joined the faculty there and was uh, on the faculty for several years. And I conducted uh, research that was published in peer reviewed journals. I held uh, leadership positions at the university and in my uh, professional organizations. And um, I even uh, had a biotech company where I invented a medical device um, and tried to uh, make that a commercial success. I've also uh, testified in a lot of uh, legal matters as an expert witness in various different courts. So I've done quite a lot of things um, in healthcare and medicine and uh, had a wide variety of experience. I think what is unique about my perspective or, or my position here is that I don't have any uh, ties or obligations to either the medical or the scientific establishment. And, um, but I do have the skills to understand scientific research and read papers. So I can report on this and express my opinion about what I believe to be true without having any uh, repercussions or uh, pressure. Excellent. All right. So, you know, for those that have been watching the high wire all the way through this pandemic, we have laid out uh, real concerns, beginning with the modeling around uh, this pandemic and the uh, the supposed deaths that were supposed to take place. Very early on, it became clear to us that this virus did not have the death rate we were being told. I would say that in many ways, we were one of the first media organizations to predict the fall of the imperial model, which, of course, it came crashing down. Uh, we have been calling out, you know, Anthony Fauci and Deborah Burks, who have continuously kept changing their story, readjusting numbers based on models. We know that they, we have bloated death numbers because of, uh, you know, the way that we are reporting deaths in hospitals. Um, all of these things we've covered. I've talked to scientists that have been on here, like Dr. James Lyons Weiler, who had first said that this was a man made virus, potentially a bioweapon that could have escaped, then decided he came back and said maybe it's natural. Zach Bush, who said he thinks that maybe this is uh, more likely to be natural. But so we've covered the gamut here. Uh, but I would say that we have been questioning the mainstream narrative from the beginning because it just doesn't add up. But you are actually taking this, I think, a step further than the high wire has ever really gone before on this topic, because up until now, uh, we are using the idea that this is a virus that has swept the nation. Maybe it was here earlier than we thought. The numbers aren't what we see, but there does seem to be some dangers when it gets into nursing homes, all of those things. You are actually questioning whether or not COVID-19 exists at all. Am I correct about that? Or please clarify your position. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, that's pretty close. So I just want to uh, separate the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is what they've named what they call as a virus, and COVID-19 being the illness. Okay. So I actually reject uh, both uh, hypotheses. Um, and But I don't want to come across as saying that I deny that there were people dying during, the, during this mortality spike from late March until May. I just uh, have different explanation for what resulted in those deaths. But what I've done from the beginning, once I noticed that there was some uh, fishy things going on in the policies of how they were handling this pandemic, because it was divergent from any past policies that I'd ever been familiar with, 
I went and looked at the papers that had claimed to isolate this virus, and uh, there are essentially four papers. And um, when I read these, I uh, read them very closely, and I had to, you know, do some investigation because they use kind of a, a lot of language that's difficult to understand unless you're publishing in this field. So it took me a bit to parse out exactly what they did, but what I found out is that they never isolated or purified a virus. So what I mean is, in order to identify a virus, it's basically a particle, right, that has a membrane and inside of it some genetic material and a few proteins uh, throughout. And so in order to identify that, what you would do is that you would basically purify it from a sick person, uh, from the disease part of their body. In this case, they took samples from lung fluid because the uh, people that they identified as having this illness uh, had respiratory symptoms. But they never actually purified any viral particles out of that lung fluid or out of their tissue culture experiments later on. Instead, what they did is they amplified a piece of genetic material that had a part of its sequence that they were specifically looking for because they had pre-identified these sequences as being from viruses. And they just basically identified a snippet of this genetic material and said that this was a virus. And they did really nothing more. So there was never a particle that was purified um, from which they would extract genetic material and say, this RNA came from this particle. Therefore, it belongs to the particle and it makes up a basically genome of a virus. If they wanted to go a step further and prove that such a virus would cause an illness, what they would have to do is then put that virus particle in a healthy host and then show that that host develops the same disease. And those are called Koch's postulates. And that's right. basically the common sense rules which the germ theory scientists originally formulated themselves to prove if a, a germ or pathogen causes an illness. And this was never done either. And this has far reaching implications because the test, the main test that's been used, the RT-PCR test that I'm sure you've talked about at length yeah. is based on this little piece of RNA that we don't know where it comes from because it came from this lung fluid, which has many, many things in it, many sources of RNA, DNA, many different kinds of cells, including human and microbial. And we also know that many what they call viral sequences have been found in our own cells and particles that our own cells make, uh, known as exosomes, in the past. So it could very well be that this RNA is from our own cells, from exosomes, or it could be from another microbial source. We just have no idea of telling where it was because they never found the particle that it came from and took it from that particle. And there's a new article that came out uh, written by uh, Torsten Engelbrecht, uh, where he actually emailed the authors of these four papers and asked them directly, um, did you show any evidence of a purified virus? And all four of them answered that they did not purify any viral particles. So they're essentially admitting that they don't know the origin of the genetic material. So just to be clear, this is something they could do, right? They, they, it is possible to isolate this particle and, and figure out where it came from, what it is. Why would they skip what seems like a really important issue? And, and I, look, if it was just a common cold and they just wanted to get to some other hypotheses and we're doing some studies in a lab somewhere that I don't care about, fine. But you have shut down the world. You have destroyed the economy of the United States of America and many other economies, most of the economies around the world. You would hope that the best science was being done before you took that step. So how hard is that step? I mean, is it like cost a billion dollars to isolate it or... Is there a reason why they would skip what seems like an obvious step to make sure we knew what we were talking about? Yeah, well, that's a great question, Dell. And, and this is why it's so important is because all of these measures that have been taken are based on this scientific assumption that has not been proven. So they would actually be able to do this as long as there were an actual viral particle that they could find. So the procedure to purify these particles has been long developed long ago and it's been used many times. So it was originally developed to isolate these viruses that live among bacteria cells called bacteriophages. And a lot of the science is based on the science of bacteriophages. 
but they've also been able to use the same technique to purify exosomes, which are particles uh, very, very similar to what they say vi virus particles are that are made by our own cells in response to some kind of illness or toxin um, or infection. And so the procedure is essentially that they take the body fluid that contains the particle and then they would uh, filter it for size to remove any bigger cells because these particles are much, much smaller than any human or bacterial cell. And then they would use several different uh, techniques using the centrifuge, which uh, can separate things uh, based on density. And they would essentially, pure, through this process, would purify the viral particles into a tight band in a test tube. And then they can pull them out with a syringe or a pipette. They can look at them under the microscope and see a pure um, homogeneous particles. They could then also take out the genetic material and have a full sequence of it from end to end, from one piece rather than from thousands of pieces. And they can also characterize the chemicals on it, like we've been told that there's an angiotensin II receptor, right? So they could do an assay and show that it's on the membrane of this particle um, quite easily. So this science has been uh, laid out. It's been done for many other uh, types of experiments, like I said, with viruses in lower organisms as well as with exosomes. So there's no reason uh, it couldn't be done. It might be slightly more expensive, it takes slightly longer to achieve, but they could, you know, first find these genetic snippets that they theoretically think may be associated with a virus, but can't prove where they're from. And then they could uh, publish that as a preliminary report and then follow up with the actual purification where they can prove, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is a virus. So and if they clear, did that, to be clear, yeah. since we've been looking at this since, you know, last December, we've certainly had enough time to have done this science by now, right? We should be able to clarify these things. And I'll be honest, I think people are used to me being somewhat skeptical of medical establishment, especially when I see steps being skipped. It makes me think they probably did it and did not come up with the type of results that they wanted, so they leave that step out. That, that's just me, I'm not gonna put that on you, but let me just then be clear. Um, are you saying that there is no virus out there that is sweeping the nation right now? Or are you saying that this is simply uh, like every other coronavirus every year, or maybe the identical coronavirus, they're just making something you know, new about something old? What is, what is your you know, exact perspective on what is making people sick? Yeah, well, I think that I think that's a question that we need to answer separately, and there may be a different answer depending on the geographic location um, right. and exactly what what has happened. But what I am saying for sure is that there is not one scientist who has isolated or purified a virus and made a concrete association with a new illness. So there's no science that proves that or anywhere even close to proving that. So there have been spikes in mortality around the world in different places, but we need to look for other causes or explanations of that since there's no solid evidence that there's a virus causing any of it. Okay, then let me ask you this question because just recently reported that in Spain, they're saying they found the SARS-CoV-2, I believe it was, uh, in the sewage from all the way back March 2019. We're seeing, you know, uh, blood tests that are going back in different countries. They're showing maybe it came here before Wuhan. What is it they're testing for and seeing if it's not SARS-CoV-2? What is that then? There's something they're seeing. There's something they're testing for. So can you explain to me what that is? Yeah, sure. Um, what they're testing for is a short snippet of genetic material, of RNA in this case. So it's the same thing that the PCR test is based upon. So just to give you a um, sort of a picture of the scale of this, they say that the full genome, which they haven't mapped in the way that I've described, but they've pieced together using computer modeling, um, okay. just like Neil Ferguson's computer modeling. But they say that it, ta it, it has, I think, 30 or 40,000 bases long, the whole genome. The little snippets that they're testing for are two to 300 bases long. So they're just a fragment of what they say uh, this whole 
uh, genomic sequence is. But once again, they don't have any proof of the origin of this uh, sequence of RNA. So what they're just showing is this sequence of RNA is present in a variety of samples. And I think the president of Tanzania even tested it on a piece of fruit and showed that it, that it was present. But if you, if you just think about the human samples for a moment, like let's say that it's our own uh, RNA that is expressed uh, under certain environmental circumstances, like perhaps when we're ill or if the humidity is really low or things like that, well, we're basically just showing the presence of our own RNA from those circumstances. So there's no way to correlate it with a virus. All right, so you're going to a place that I, I mean, this is really interesting, and I want to get back to a question just based on how we're proving uh, the RNA uh, and, and its relationship to SARS and others. But before we do, I want to go here because I can't get a straight answer on this. It seems like, I mean, I, as I travel around and meet lots of very interesting scientists, there seems to be a question about what has long been referred to as germ theory, right? This idea that viruses travel through the air, we get them from the outside, they come in, we get sick. I'm hearing more and more scientists speak to what I believe is being referred to as terrain, uh, a, a new concept of terrain theory that your body expresses perhaps the measles from the inside, it's already there. I've heard it described as perhaps it's like a channel that's turned on or something that's turned on. Can you give me, because I still am waiting for an explanation, and I know that ex exosomes might be a part of this. Can you try to convince me uh, that our body creates these things from the inside? What is your theory on that? Because I'm still very, very confused uh, about this idea. Sure. Well, uh, terrain theory is actually not that new, although it is gaining some traction right now. And a lot of people in the natural healing space actually devise their approaches based on terrain theory. And essentially what it says is rather than a germ coming from the outside and causing an illness, that germs actually are part of the repair mechanism after there's damage to our tissue from an illness. So there be some insult uh, that causes an illness and you know commonly that could be uh, related to malnutrition, like a breakdown of a tissue, not being able to function. It could be a toxic exposure. There are many sources of that. It could be a traumatic injury. And once the uh, damage is halted, then your body basically calls on microbes from different areas to come and clean up the area just like they do in nature. And during the cleanup process, and they work in tandem with our immune system, they would secrete factors that would cause local symptoms like tissue swelling in order to increase the blood flow to that area to bring nutrients for repair and to remove toxic waste. It would also cause secretions, right? Like the runny nose that you have in a cold, which is basically your body's way of expelling the waste products from that tissue damage out of your body. Um, so that's essentially a, the model of terrain theory. The science behind it was put forth by a number of different scientists, including Antoine Béchamp, who was a contemporary and rival of Louis Pasteur, uh, as well as Enderlein and Gaston Naissance. And they have mapped out basically these tiny little particles that come from our own cells. And they've viewed these, and you can view videos of this under a microscope. It uses a special kind of microscope called a dark field microscope, which allows us to visualize cells while they're alive. In regular medicine, they always use dead and fixed tissue under the microscope, so you could never observe the behavior of the cells. But what you see under dark field microscopy is that, let's say you're looking at a sample of red blood cells, you see these little spots of light or flecks of light and they bud out of the cells and then they start changing their shape into different forms. And this kind of cyclic development has been mapped out by those scientists that I mentioned and shown that basically they change shape into different mature forms of bacteria and fungi, all the microbes that normally live in our body. And that in response to a specific illness, they might change shape into certain species that are better at responding to that part of the body or at cleaning up that type of damage. And so it's really fascinating to see how this has all come together through these scientific experiments. And that overall uh, property or process is known as pleomorphism, 
where the organisms can change their shape, which pleomorphism means many shapes. Do you think this pandemic is, is bringing more attention to this concept? And, and if I'm to understand from a lay perspective, then there's, whether you're hypothesizing this, I know several people are, that perhaps this RNA code that was found has been produced by our own bodies or certain those that were tested in China and other places as a repair mechanism to some other, whether it was pollution in Wuhan or, or too many antibiotics, whatever their body was trying to overcome, that it was produced from the inside of the body and therefore is capable for bodies all around the world to produce this very RNA. And, and, and what I found so fascinating when I was just lightly looking at this is we do hear so much conversation about asymptomatic carriers. And it just, it really just, there seems to be that, like, I want, like, the exclamation point, question mark, you know, above the head of every scientist, as they really seem confused on trying to explain what's happening. Why are we testing people that are, you know, already had it and had no idea they had it? Or, you know, uh, as, as we have discussed, um, why, you know, in, in, in with Dr. Friston's work, who we featured, He's finding, you know, as he mapped the world as though he's mapped a brain, one of the top brain scientists, that there appears to be 50 to 80 percent of the population, based on the way his models work, that can't get uh, this illness or don't seem to be being infected by it. It does lead to somebody's not understanding something, and it le then we get to testing, right? So if we're testing for this, and it's natural inside of some people, or maybe all of us, or maybe just during certain times, it would lead to, you know, uh, we, we saw a, a declaration by a congressman last week on our show saying, even when we do these antibody tests, scientists don't really even know what a positive test means. Even tests meeting FDA's standards can be false more than half of the time, especially if the prevalence of COVID-19 in the surrounding population is low. And even with a true positive, scientists are not sure even what that means. So are you suggesting that there's a potential that this is just RNA that our bodies create naturally and we are locking everybody down, putting masks on them for something that just simply may exist inside of them by nature? Yes, yeah, that's essentially exactly what I'm suggesting. And, you know, when... When our bodies are exposed to some kind of insult, right, even if you just get a little laceration, there's a response. Our bodies make certain uh, antibodies, proteins, our, our cells mobilize to respond to make sure that, you know, nothing dangerous has invaded the integrity of our bodies. And I think that um, we could simply be measuring some response like that that's very nonspecific. And there's really no way to tell what this test is measuring because if you look at the RNA test, it's, we don't know the source of the RNA and there's no gold standard to compare it to, so there's no known error rate and you can't calculate one. The antibody test is even less specific and even the FDA and their guidance about the antibody tests said that they should not be used for diagnosis. And with the PCR test, the CDC, as well as the manufacturers in their package insert say that the test should not be used for diagnosis. So what I think is essentially happening is that the more tests we conduct, the more positives we're gonna have, and then the media is reporting an increase in the number of cases, just based on these testing results without any need even for clinical information, like whether someone is sick or not. Let me ask you this question. You know, we're calling it SARS-CoV-2, which means that it apparently is, is extremely similar to the SARS coronavirus that was extremely deadly, did not do nearly the damage that was expected. Uh, what is the science behind connecting it to SARS? Is it identical to SARS? I mean, I hear that the only difference is maybe just a slight spike protein. Uh, have they determined that this really is just another SARS coronavirus? Well, I want to first say that the original SARS virus wasn't isolated either, and they used the same exact uh, procedures in that. So you have to really question the basis of comparison to something that wasn't clearly proven in origin in the first place. <laughs> right. But what they say is, based on a fragment, once again, a fragment or a few fragments of RNA, 
that there was an 84% sequence identity. Therefore, it's the same or a related, closely related virus. But I'll tell you, if you look at the sequence identity between humans and chimpanzees, a totally different species, we have 96% sequence identity, much higher than the, the identity between these two alleged viruses. Wow. So I don't really understand how they could even relate them based on such a low percentage of sequence identity. Interesting. I, I want to play a video for you. Uh, I don't know. I, I would imagine that you're aware that in New York, in the middle of this crisis where I think nearly a third of the deaths in America occurred, uh, New York, New Jersey, uh, there was an ER doctor that came forward. I've been referring to him as Paul Revere because I believe he came out and really had the guts to announce and warn the world uh, that, you know, all this has been happening in closed hospitals, right? We're not allowed in. We're not allowed to see what's happening there. We're not allowed to see the hospital beds. So it's only been reports from doctors that are coming out to report to us. But he said something very interesting. This is just a couple of months ago. Of course, I'm talking about Dr. Cameron Kyle Seidel. Let me just play this clip really quick. Nine days ago, I opened an intensive care unit to care for the sickest COVID positive patients in this city. In these nine days, I have seen things I have never seen before. In treating these patients, I have witnessed medical phenomenon that just don't make sense in the context of treating a disease that is supposed to be a viral pneumonia. COVID-19 lung disease, as far as I can see, is not a pneumonia and should not be treated as one. It appears as some kind of viral induced disease, most resembling high altitude sickness. I have seen patients dependent on oxygen take off their oxygen and quickly progress through a state of anxiety and emotional distress and eventually get blue in the face. And while they look like patients absolutely on the brink of death, they do not look like patients dying of pneumonia. The patients I'm seeing in front of me uh, look most like as if a person was dropped off on the top of Mount Everest without time to acclimate. Uh, I don't know the final answer of this disease but I'm quite sure that a ventilator is not it. All right, so I, I think this video that, that Kyle Seidel put out led to a, a sort of shift, at least, in the protocols in hospitals. The NIH ended up saying we need to back away from ventilators, maybe move into giving people oxygen, which seems like that should have been a no-brainer from the beginning. We know that those ventilators killed 9 out of 10 people, and that's something that I've spoken out about. Uh, we've had scientists, I believe that hydroxychloroquine should be under much uh, uh, more consideration because of the successful trials uh, that have been all over the world. But what it points to and what I want to sort of challenge you with is Kyle Seidel is talking about a very specific set of symptoms that he has never seen before, yet is seeing it you know, in congruency amongst multiple patients. And he's reaching out to the doctors around the world saying, I know you're seeing this same anomaly too. And once I think in, I don't think we've seen the full adjustment, but it does appear as doctors adjust to seeing this more as a blood illness than maybe a respiratory illness. So we, we've talked about the heme and how SARS-CoV-2 uh, appears to be attaching to red blood cells. All of this to me sounds like a very specific illness that true only is really having this you know mortal or acute effect on about i think 0.26 percent of the population but how do you explain that from your perspective when there's such congruity with whatever this is and how people that are having acute reaction are reacting to it right well there's a uh, many things to consider i i think the most important thing to realize is that um at least in the united states uh, doctors have been prevented from sending these patients for autopsy. If we were able to autopsy these patients, then we would know really what was the cause of death. Um, there is some data from Italy where they did a series of autopsies and they found a lot of blood clots in the lungs. And uh, so in other words, a pulmonary embolism. And this is generally not caused by viruses. It has many causes, but sedating people and putting them on a ventilator could certainly cause uh, blood clots in the lung. And that could cause problems with oxygenation that could lead to the symptoms that were described. There's also, you know, many, many other possibilities. Like one thing that just came right into my mind when I first heard uh, that video that you just played was that it sounds like cyanide poisoning. But of course, you know, I don't know if anyone's looked into that or if they did any tests uh, to that would confirm that. 
I'm um, not sure of the data. There was no, see, when something like this happens that is an anomaly during a health crisis, what it should um, lead to is a major investigation where anyone that dies in that suspicious way or has those suspicious symptoms, if they do die, they should be autopsied. There should be investigators from public health agencies that should be coming in to try and figure out what's going on there. But there was no such effort that I'm aware of of it all. And it seems like Dr. Seidel was pretty much silenced. Like I heard that he was taken off the ICU duty. And uh, certainly we haven't heard any more from him uh, that I'm aware of anyway since that time. So I think this is still really somewhat mysterious as to what causes it. But as he described, it is not the typical viral pneumonia, which is what they described in the original patients in Wuhan and in many other clinical reports. Whatever it is, do you think we're having a shared experience across the world, though? Do you believe whether this is RNA that comes in from inside of us? Is this RNA that is having an ill effect on a certain population, but it's similar around the world? Or do you think we are just sort of grabbing different... I mean, we know that there's a lot of comorbidities directly involved, whether it's heart disease, COPD, diabetes. They keep sort of shifting this list. and. I think, I, I think I heard the CDC may have, you know, whatever. It, it keeps changing. Uh, do you believe that there, whatever it is, that there's a similarity to it around the world? Or do you think we're just sort of lumping in a bunch of different ailments and, and making it into a disease? Yeah, well, I, I think that there, there is some similarity because I think um, most of the deaths are actually a direct result or an indirect result of these lockdown type of policies that we've seen around the world. Right. Because, you know, this happened, you know, very suddenly in a heartbeat right after the World Health Organization announced the pandemic status. And suddenly you have people, you know, that are out of work. Right. They're they're told to stay home and lock themselves in. They're put in this state of intense fear, which has a lot of deleterious effects on, on our physical and mental aspects of our life. And then they also are basically prohibited from accessing health care. So like here's one thing that's really underreported and there's no certain statistics, but there is a one study that looks at this indirectly that shows that between one and two percent of all presentations to the emergency department in the United States are due to low blood sugar from diabetes medications. So if you're suddenly put in a fear state, locked in your house, your activities change, and you can't access your doctor, like you're gonna have different eating habits, different activities, so your insulin or other requirements for those medications are gonna change, and people were afraid to go to the ER in an emergency, even with heart attacks and things like that, because they thought they would get this virus and die. So I think a lot of it is just from not having access to that type of care and people simply got very sick and died in their homes. Uh, we've seen many, many other factors, like we've seen a big increase in suicides um, yep. because of all the right devastation that people have had in their lives. Uh, there's increased addiction because, you know, liquor stores were always maintained as an essential business. and. Uh, being a psychiatrist, I, I was curious and found out that actually street drugs were still available um, and plentiful, so people still had access to this, but a lot of extra time, and then they started getting government checks, so they had sort of free money. Um, then there was, of course, the mismanagement in the hospitals and the nursing homes, and I don't think we can underestimate this. You know, I have this kind of vision of what went on in the nursing homes, that they sent people who were ill there they said they were COVID positive everyone was totally scared to go near them so they essentially neglected them they uh you know had a dnr status on people even if it was against the family Do not wishes resuscitate, right yep exactly and uh, i even heard a testimony from some nursing care um, nurses that worked in these facilities that they couldn't even get access to regular pharmaceuticals that they were just sending things like morphine and uh, hospice end-of-life type drugs so they didn't even have, you know, the normal aspects to treat these people. So, you know, all of these factors and several more coming together and then with, you know, variations in different culture and geographic situations, you know, a lot of people have talked about the degree of air pollution in Wuhan and in northern Italy. So those may be factors too, but are, are those, you know, different year to year or is it the same 
and uh, you know not something unique to this year. And I agree with you completely that you know we this information is not being uh, put out transparently that we can't you know have definitive answers and that's the, to all these questions. That's the problem, really. And, and I think that whether or not you know I again I said at the top before I, I we got in this interview that I think time is the only thing that will really bring us to the final answers, especially when science is not being properly done. If there's one thing I know that I definitely agree with you on is that it just seems like the science is not being properly done. As you described that we would have a way of isolating the particle, yet they're not doing it. It reminds me of a lot of the work that I've done, which is, you know, why aren't we doing placebo studies on vaccines that we give our children if they're really safe? If vaccines make us healthier, why aren't you doing the most obvious study known to man, which is to compare vaccinated children to unvaccinated children? And people really attack me, you know, including NewsGuard or fact checkers. And I say, look, I'm just a journalist that's saying I know how science is usually being done. And I'm incredibly skeptical and dismayed when obvious science is not being done. So let me ask you the final question that I get asked all the time as I discuss the issues that I've done a lot of investigation into, which is this. Who is behind this? Who, there, there must be because it's not just one country. It's not just America. I, I see the World Health Organization. But why is no one in the world studying this particle? Why is no one really proving whether it's an exosome or a virus that's traveling in the air. Why is no one, and yet we are all using terrible models, continuing to move forward to destroy our economies, wearing more and more masks, it looks like into eternity, taking away more and more of our rights, in your opinion, um, and, 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 I, and I've been talking with my team. At one point I thought, well, this is just doctors and medicine, and this is, you know, they're just taking control of the world, but hospitals are shutting down. Doctors are losing their jobs, there's something it seems much more sinister or bigger out there. Do you have a theory on what is behind the lack of science, the, the moving forward with terrible data, the lack of results, the misunderstandings, and, and really um, a forceful attack on medical freedom with what seems like no evidence whatsoever? There must be something behind it. What is your theory there? Yeah, well, I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, evidence to look at here. And one thing that's really telling is that basically what happened is that we had almost all the nations of the world initiate virtually the same exact identical policies to deal with this situation at the same time. And this is really unprecedented, and it shows that there's not individual national sovereignty, because otherwise there would be a lot more variation in how different nations decided to handle this situation. Now, you can look at many documents and many organizations like, like the Rockefeller Foundation, like the World Economic Forum, right? We know, I'm sure you've reported about Event 201. There are many documents and exercises like that that all seem to have planning elements related to our current situation. I think the World Economic Forum is the most detailed and impressive. And if you haven't looked at their website, you should definitely look at a couple of things. Look at their plan for the big reset, which mm -hmm. is clearly been in the making for decades. Um, and then look at their strategic initiative, I believe, the chart that goes 200 layers deep. And you'll see that there has inten been intense planning to every aspect of how these things fit together. And you're right, even if there was a real virus that really was scary, why would it require shutting down all of the businesses that were shut down? Why would it require shutting down hospitals? Why would it require laying off healthcare workers the opposite of what you would expect in such a right. crisis, right? So nothing, nothing really adds up here. So there is another motive. And I believe that the, the motivation is really to um, rework or re-engineer our society into a global system with extremely limited freedoms. And that's why they've been taking away our freedoms and telling us the only way to restore any freedom is to allow um, the governments to monitor our every move and every aspect of our health and our body's integrity and possibly and even our behavior, where we go, who we congregate with, right? And that's not going to obviously create more freedom. It's going to be a device for more control. 
And I want to add one uh, really important thought, and I think this speaks to one of your big, uh, the biggest issue for you, which is that if there is no virus that's been proven, then what is the vaccine going to really be for? Mm. That is a question that will probably keep me up tonight. Um, Dr. Andrew Kaufman, uh, I want to thank you for taking the time. Uh, I, I, I can see why so many people were asking to be on here. And, and I hope that as this thing moves forward, maybe we can have you back as we will get more details. I believe that the light is shining down. I think more and more scientists, you know, at one point, someone's saying the things that you're saying. I know you're coming into some conflicts, but there are a lot of world-renowned scientists really, I think, starting to ask the right questions. So it seems to me if we all continue to demand that the science be done, uh, we're going to get to some answers. But thank you for taking the time and thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, Dell. Thank you so much for the opportunity. If you like that clip, then be sure to check out our live broadcast of The High Wire every Thursday morning at 11 a.m. Pacific time. You can watch it on Facebook, YouTube, iTunes, and Twitter. We'll see you there.